I want to get into my big idea or my aha topic of today. Um, and that is metaphors. I want to talk about metaphors. So some of you might have paid attention to some of the, the previous shows that we put together here. Uh, a common theme I have is that what we see happens to be the key to our success in the world, what we perceive in the world and perceiving and thinking and behaving. They're all kind of wrapped up together because if we change the way we see the world, we'll change the way we think about the world. If we change the way that we think about the world, we'll change the way we behave in the world. And if we change the way we behave in the world, it will change the way we perceive things that will change the way we think about things. I think we all kind of get that. But the thing that we tend to overlook, as I've said many times before, is we tend to focus, especially in transformation, like an agile transformation, organizational transformation, we focus on the behavior. And we hope that by focusing on behavior that it's going to change the way we perceive things and the way we think about things. But my experience, and I've been doing this for a very long time, is that that's not always true. We're going to be more successful long term if we change the way we see the world. And the way we change, uh, how we change the, the way things are seen in the world is we use metaphors, or at least this is what I'm going to propose. It's very simple. I can see things different than you do. In fact, we all see things different. We don't see the world exactly the same. We cannot. We always filter it. We have all our cognitive biases or cognitive illusions, as I talk about in my training. But in order for us to communicate, I need you to see what I see. And that, to me, is really what communication is about. Two people have different mental models, different pictures or whatever you want to call it in their head. And if we're going to be successful in communicating, we need to be able to paint a picture so that the other person kind of sees or perceives what we see. And the question is, how do I do this? And the answer, and this is something that will help you, I hope, in personal relationships, not just in, in uh, agile or, or organizational change or, or how you navigate the VUCA world, is I need to find common ground. I need to find something that we both have a vision of and I need to bridge what I see to something that we both can agree on, something that we both have a common vision of. In other words, we use, uh, for lack of a better word, metaphors. We use other things, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna group them under metaphors. We use parables, we use stories, we use other things. I'm just gonna, for the for the sake of this, I'm gonna call them metaphors. Let me give you an example. Um, I use tons of metaphors actually in my training. I think it's one of the reasons that I, I'm able to uh, connect pretty well with people uh, in my training. And I think it's one of the, the, the values that you will find uh, if you have to take my training. And I think a lot of people would probably agree with this. The metaphors help build that bridge. So I, I in fact, I, uh, one of the things that uh, I've spoken about before is I, I've got a book that I'm working on. It's been taking me a while, but I'm, I want to write a book is, is the Agile Book of Metaphors, because I think that the metaphors that we use help us to understand agility, under, understand how to thrive in the VUCA world. I have one metaphor, um, and that metaphor is cooks versus chefs. So when I talk with my folks in my training, I say, what I'm trying to do in my training is I'm trying to create chefs and not cooks. And the difference between a cook and a chef is that a cook can follow a recipe, but a chef understands the recipe and can make adjustments to the recipe. So what I see in the world is I think it is more important for someone to understand the why behind things that are done, especially in the VUCA world, as opposed to just doing what someone asked them to do. That is the difference between cooks and chefs. And what I want you to see, and the reason I'm using the metaphor of cooks versus chef, is I want you to see the importance of understanding intent versus just understanding actions. And this is really uh, something that happens very often in my practice as an agile coach, as a VUCA consultant. When I talk with organizations, I talk with people, a lot of times they say, okay, what should I do in this new world? 
and what I'm more, that is a, that to me, for lack of a better word, is a cook mentality. What I would prefer is a chef mentality. What should I see in the new world? What should I think about in the new world? I was just, um, there's a book that came out that was a cookbook. If anybody's, I'm sure, have read cookbooks. Um, and I've been a cook, by the way. Um, and uh, if you want to be a chef, I think there's one that's got salt, acid, heat, and um, fat, fat and heat or something. I can't remember the exact. Uh, it basically says, look, these are four major elements of cooking. You need to understand these elements because you need to balance these elements in order to be a good cook, a good, uh, sorry, a good chef, not a cook. You don't just need to follow the recipe. You need to understand why these ingredients are put together the way they are. So you can almost predict what the, the recipe will taste like when you change it, because you know what each part of the recipe brings to the whole. The other thing I see is, that, is if you look at the, the folks that we would consider the top leaders in the world, historically, um, I just for fun, I went into our good friend ChatGPT and I said, ChatGPT, who are the 10 most influential people of all time? Um, and it gave me a list. And I looked at that list. And the thing that I saw, the reason that they're the most influential people is they saw the world differently. That's step one. That was the one thing that these 10 individuals that ChatGPT came up with, and I'm sure you'd come up with more had in common. The second thing is that they saw their primary work, at least I'm extrapolating that they saw their primary work of getting others and helping others to see the way they saw the world, to see the world differently as well, to see what they saw. And three, the other thing that I found that was very common among these people is that they made a liberal use of metaphors and stories and parables. So I want to give you a few examples. I'm not going to name all the 10 people that chat GPT, but I, I, I picked a, a few of them. And I think these are ones that will resonate with, with you all as an audience to understand how metaphors make a big difference. One of them, Jesus, in, in, in the Christian tradition, Jesus uh, spoke in the New Testament. And there's not a lot of words, actually, if you look at the New Testament compared, you know, compared to the rest of the Bible, it's small. And the things that Jesus said in the, in the New Testament are small compared to the rest of the Bible. But when he did speak, he often, if not always, spoke in parables. Parables to me just being extended metaphors or stories, metaphor-like, if you want. And some examples is the, the example of the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, and the Mustard Seed. These are some of the most famous parables. So those folks who are familiar with the Christian tradition and the New Testament would understand these parables and, and realize what Jesus was trying to get folks to see, what was important in his vision. That's the other thing that these people had, right? They had vision. That's how we describe it. Buddha, he's the one, if you, if you know the metaphor or, or I guess maybe metaphor, parable, whatever you want to call it, of the blind man and the elephant. We're all probably familiar with that, where there's a bunch of different blind men and they touch the elephant in different places. And they say, oh, this is a rope because they touch the tail. This is a wall because they touch the body, et cetera. Uh, that came to us from Buddha, as well as his own version of the mustard seed. And, and I, the, the thing that's really interesting about these is notice how simple these things are. We all know about the relationships of sons and daughters. We all know, at least they did at the time, what a mustard seed is, right? We know what elephants are. Confucius talked about the farmers, the farmer in the weeds, and, and the farmer has to be more patient because he was, he was pulling at his garden and trying to get the weeds out. But while he's pulling the weeds out, he's also pulling out the good stuff, um, which is a wonderful metaphor sometimes about how we do business, right? We have to have some patience because sometimes things take time. And he also talks about the mountain and the river, uh, the mountain being a, a metaphor for those who are virtuous and strong and the river being those who are wise, who can change over time. Again, mountains and rivers are things that people he spoke with would certainly be familiar with. And Martin Luther King uses a lot of metaphors um, and as I have a dream speech, he talks about the check of justice, the promise that was made in the original constitution. 
and the payment that's still due was the check of justice. And he, he talks a lot about the promised land and, and, and Martin Luther King, obviously being a preacher, spoke very much in, in the, the Christian tradition of uh, um, relating to Bible stories that other people would be familiar with. It's through using these stories and the things that we know that we have in common as far as our visions that we can bridge into the new visions and the new understanding of the world. And that's my big idea for the day.